Thank you very much, and I'm sure you were fascinated by that as I was, so I'm sure there's lots of questions. Hi, my name is Sunny Baines, I'm at Imperial College and I'm not a programmer. Um, but my PhD was related to exactly these issues. Um, I'm very interested in the analog side, and one of the things that I found interested, interesting is that, like Penrose actually, you kind of brushed off the analog nature of the brain. Yes, the spikes yes. look digital, but the timing is analog. The timing is really quite analog, and the correlations of the spike timing is important. So that's something I'm interested in. Also, with Watson, you talked about the fact that, ah, we let the signal processing get done elsewhere, and we just feed in the symbols, the text. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I'm very interested in is the analog shell. <coughs> and if you're talking about the computability of the mind, yes. it seems to me that that analog shell has to be factored in there. Now, I don't really care one way or another whether, you know, I think the argument about computability is a little bit moot, because, because I think you have to have analog elements, and anal analog is not computable. And, in the strict sense of the word. Yes. But I just wondered if you could expand on some of those issues for me. What a delicious question. <laughs> I, I think there's, is it the Cindy Lauper song, I'm a material girl, is it the Cindy Lauper? <laughs> so I am, I am a digital a man in an analog world. And let me, let me tear apart, not tear apart, let me tease apart the three elements that I heard there. One is, let's talk about the neurons themselves. You are exactly correct that the neuron in its spiking behavior can be modeled digitally, but ultimately it's giving us signals or responding to signals that are temporal in nature. Absolutely correct. However, we also know that in digital systems that we can model temporal things very, very well. I just came back from a week in the uh, IBM Almaden Laboratories where there's a project called Synapse. Go, go Google it and you'll see it. But we've been able to build uh, uh, artificial neurons that do exactly that. So the challenge that you're addressing is, how do these digital things relate to the analog world? And the answer is, well, we sort of know how to do that through a variety of A to D and D to A kind of things. That we can build devices that, that talk to the analog world even though they are time-centric in nature. So what Synapse has done is actually build, been able to build digital models of the neuron that behave exactly like what we see the neuron do in terms of uh, population messaging and, and time kind of ordering of the spikes. So uh, we can talk afterwards, but I can show you the papers that show we know how to do that already. There's an interesting philosophical issue which says that some believe that the universe itself may be digital down at the bottom. The notion that the Planck constant is the smallest divisible thing in Planck time is the smallest divisible thing, so at its bottom it may be a digital thing. So that may be the case. There was a third thing you mentioned that just totally blew out of my head, but it was fascinating. Oh, about Watson, I think. Uh, the whole statistical things were sort of off to the side. Watson is, Watson, is, Watson is interesting because Watson is this architecture. It's about a million and a half lines of Java and little bits of C++. And we're able to do a lobotomy on Watson by taking out all of the data and replacing it with new stuff. In fact, there was a time that Watson had as part of its mind the Urban Dictionary. And the problem is Watson started swearing. <laughs> so we had to pull that bit out of it. And in the early versions of Watson, working with Jeopardy, Watson was filled up with Wikipedia and uh, lots of news sources and, and, and lots of word lists and the like. Obviously, if I'm a doctor, I'm not going to care about puns. That's really a bad thing to deal with. <laughs> a doctor walks into a bar and says. So we've removed those bits of it and basically have taught Watson all sorts of other things. So the fascinating thing about Watson's architecture is that its knowledge base is nearly independent from its architecture. So it's possible for us to bring new kinds of things in. Now you mentioned the notion of the separation of the statistics and I wasn't. The single processing. The single processing. But Watson wasn't a single processor. Watson was. I, oh, the signal processing, got it. Okay, with the signal processing, it goes back to the notion that we know how to digitize those things. And furthermore, we can go the opposite direction as well. The question well. is, is mm -hmm. the signal processing bit, is the analog to digital bit, which is at least a bit analog, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> is that part of the machine? And if it is, I mean, in the strict sense of computable, yes. if the A to D conversion is part of the machine, then it's not computable, right? Because that first bit is not computable. That the, getting the system oh, I see your point is. 
the interface of the, of the A to D and D to A. Actually, it is computable because I can take an analog signal and I can build an algorithm, that's what fast Fourier transforms and the like are for, that I can take an analog signal and pull out the digital bits. So I think you're asking if how many angels dance on the head of the pin at that place. Is that computable? Wow. Um, okay, I may accept that that's debatable as to whether or not that interface is computable. But I don't think that matters. No, I, okay. don't, I don't necessarily okay. think okay, it good. does too, but the okay. analog shell, I just think yeah, the has, analog to be, shell. Yeah. has to be accepted. The, the analog shell has to be accepted, and indeed this is what Rodney Brooks speaks of, that we can't build disembodied brains. They're pretty dull. Uh, but we have to interact with the human, with the with the real world. On that, you and I are in violent agreement. I think that the the analog and digital debate is an interesting debate, but less so than the fact that the the mind tends to think in a, a logarithmic manner, not in a linear manner. Um, and it's been shown that software systems are very capable of thinking in this logarithmic manner in ratios without the absolute necessity to make a, a linear link between one thing and another. And this in itself links to uh, one of the best descriptions of intelligence that was given by uh, Feuermann, who said that uh, the def definition of intelligence is to be able to learn something in one state with one set of references and be able to take what is learnt and apply it in a totally different state with a totally different set of references. Do you feel that computing is capable of making that kind of leap? I don't want to call it intuitive because I don't think it's entirely intuitive, but the, the same application of taking something that intrinsically doesn't belong and allowing it to belong in a different way in a different place. What's fascinating about your question is that it causes us to even ask, what does it mean inside the human mind to make those kinds of creative leaps? It's very difficult for us to answer that. We do know that especially creative people are those who are able to connect the dots from very disparate things. We see Picasso who can do a, a cubist rendition from which we, we see what he is seeing in very different ways. So his mind has made this incredible leap Turns out there's a program called Aaron, which does very similar kinds of things. You may say, let's take a musician, somebody who can say, you know, I have this riff and I, I feel it in this way and I want to apply it in this way and, and I get a certain kind of feeling and I bring it together. And we can speak of brilliant musicians. And a good example of this is a musician named uh, Emily Howell, who has built some, some blindingly beautiful classical music that's reminiscent of, of Bach and others, except that Emily is a program as well, too. Emily Howell is a program that's analyzed a number of other classical musicians and gotten the, the knowledge of how they bring things together and, and mix them together in interesting ways. Watson is another example of the path that you were describing in that Watson has some basic meta-mechanisms for how it learns, and it's able to learn both about natural language and puns, and it's applying those same kinds of ideas to how one interprets an x-ray or an MRI. So already we see evidence that we are on that path to do so. The other interesting thing that's happened in the last really five or so years is there have been tremendous breakthroughs made in what people call deep learning, learning that happens not at the level of just three neural nets, which has sort of been what it's been the last decade or so, but neural nets that are much, much deeper in their nature and the ability to really burn in not just learning in one domain, but the learning of how one learns. So we're beginning to see systems that have become meta in their nature. And I think that's a fundamental shift because ultimately the mind in its way is very, very meta. I know that I know I am talking to you. That's meta. Um, it seems to me that the uh, brain is a highly parallel device or whatever you want to call it, yes. and, um, and indeed an asynchronous, highly parallel yes. device. And as a result, the way in which our brains work is highly non-deterministic. And so I think there's a sort of distinction, if you like, between the possibility, the likelihood of being able to create sentient devices on the one hand, and the question you po pose as your sort of subtitle, which is, is the brain computable? In the sense that it's 
behaviour is non-deterministic, I think that computability, certainly in its formal sense, probably doesn't apply. But I, I, I'm absolutely with you that we will be able to create sentient devices. Yeah. So the way I would approach that is to say the individual bits of the, the brain appear to be very deterministic in nature. That each one of the neurons has a well-defined state machine associated with them. And yet, when you combine all these together on the order of 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 16th such devices, their behavior is so complex it becomes a hard NP problem in that we can't actually predict what they're going to do, although the things under themselves are very deterministic. So in that sense, you know, we, to, to, to model the brain and predict it, you have to build the whole brain itself, but the individual pieces are deterministic is the way I describe it. So I wouldn't declare the brain to be non-deterministic. It's deterministic. It's just that our understanding of it is such that it's an NP-complete problem. Thank you. My name is Charles Ross. Uh, fascinating. Um, you started talking there about the possibility um, of being able to compute creativity. Yes. And then you gave the example of uh, writing a program that made some beautiful music. <coughs> But it's rule-based, because what I think you were saying was that somebody had taken some wonderful music from Bach and Beethoven and that thing, and uh, mixed it up, if I could uh, not be rude to it. Yes. Um, brilliantly clever, but it's rule-based. Creativity is not rule-based. Although any musician is going to understand the rules at first, I will go through a long period in which I'll learn the scales, I'll I'll learn the riffs that work. And so I think e any you know, reasonably competent musician is going to embody those rules within them, but then they also make the leaps that connect things in interesting ways, the heuristics that combine them. I think at the base, any creative thing is going to be full of rules, whether or not it manifests itself as a rule-based system is another issue. But it's the next level up, the meta level, that allows those things to connect. And that's exactly how Emily Howell works. That's exactly how the Aaron program works as well, too. A set of rules upon which we have things on top of it that combine them in interesting ways. Watson does it in a statistical way. I don't, haven't dove particularly into the exact architecture of Emily, of Emily Howell, but I know it's not purely rule-based. But again, what I find interesting about this question is that it poses the question for us is, how do creative humans create things? It forces us to ask, how is it this person can build this music and I can't, even though I've gone through the same classes? We don't know the answer to that question, but it is very meta. And so the delicious thing about this journey we're on here, no matter how far we go, I think it requires us to look inside ourselves and learn some things about ourselves as well, too. Thank you. Good question. Thank you very much. My name is Mohammed Ajab. I think I'd agree with you that um, from one perspective, I think you can build a model, I suppose, that is in some sense discrete and will always compete very well, I think, with human beings in terms of answering questions like Watson, for example. But I'm, I, I can't argue also about the change in behavior when you have multiple systems working together. Yeah. But the difference is, I think, as you already alluded to, is that if you have two Watsons with the same database, effectively, they'll give you exactly the same answer. If you ask you know, two human beings the same question, they'll actually give you totally different perspectives. Similarly, in the same way as, for example, you can learn from experience that fire will heat up something, but then how do you translate you know, that fire uh, into understanding it's actually a defensive weapon as well, you know, back in the eight man day or whatever you like. So how do you actually go about moving from a deduction, uh, as we were talking earlier on, to actually more of a generalization or actually in fact a different use of that same deduction? Right, and which that, is I think, that, is some that really separates, I think, human beings today from, you know, discrete mechanisms, however we build them. Could you just comment on that? You bet. So let me actually attend to one of your premises, is, which is, would two Watsons give you the exact same answer? We've never done that because we haven't had two Watsons <laughs> side by side. But knowing Watson's architecture, I would say the answer is probably no, that they wouldn't necessarily get the same answer because there are things that happen in time ordering that are different from one Watson to another. And it would also mean that you would have to have trained both Watsons 
exactly the same amount in exactly the same order. But then you could claim, but what if I did that with a human as well, too? And we know with a human, it's impossible to do it exact. And so if you have some variations, the humans are going to behave differently. Watson would behave differently as well. So I think your premise is interesting, but it's wrong. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> and therefore, the rest of your argument just falls apart. No, it's not true. <laughs> um, but, but then you address the issue. Uh, let me see the, the, the second part of it, which is, I forgot the second part of it, which was a generalized deduction, uh, a generalized deduction right. The, the fast, yeah, the fascinating thing about Watson is that it both works through induction and deduction. And so the interesting question is how much meta information do you put within Watson? Does forward chaining and backward chaining? How much meta do you put into it? And how much training do you give Watson so that it can learn ways to do that? There is a little bit of learning that Watson does along the way. As an example, in, in some of the, uh, the games that Watson did, um, it makes, so in Jeopardy, there's a category. Uh, it's like, you know, Gravity's Rainbow is one example of them. And if Watson tries it at first, it makes him potentially some really stupid answers. But along the way, it realizes, oh, that answer was wrong. Why was it wrong? I learned some things about it. So it learns along the way. And it can actually hone into the category a bit better. So Watson has some real-time learning capability. And where they're headed with it, is to make Watson even more conversational so that you can say, you know, Watson says, I think this, and the doctor may come back and say, well, what do you think about this? And Watson may come back and say, well, it might be this or this, and if you could give me the answer to this, and I could give you a more precise answer. So Watson begins that kind of dialogue, and that's non-deterministic from the outside, but Watson's following a fully deterministic kind of process. The last thing I'd mention is there's another gentleman who's followed the path you described. That's Doug Lanat in a program called Psych. Because he's dealing with the problem of common sense, like you said with fire. A fire can be used for a variety of things. So his idea of Psych is to build a system that embodies hundreds of thousands of rules that therefore has a notion of common sense. Fire can be hot, fire can, it can melt all those kinds of things. So there's an attempt to codify that. And there's, there's work in that space. Again, it asks the question, how do you know that to be the case? And if you can come up with an answer, then we can teach our machines that as well, too. Okay. Good question. So, gentleman behind. Rob Nicholson from IBM. Um, thank you for a, a stimulating lecture. Um, you said at one point that you disagreed with Ray Kurtzell's timeline. Yes. But my question is, do you agree with this hypothesis that one day we will build a computer that is able to design a more powerful computer and so on, and, and, and thus we lead to a singularity? Um, well, we already do that today, although it requires human intervention, uh, because we build devices that allow us to build better semiconductors, that allow us to build better semiconductors. There's a human within the loop in that case. Um, I don't believe we'll ever see a singularity because we will be in the midst of it such that we will never see it happening. This is what Rodney Brooks describes. He, he's often asked the same question, do you think, believe in the singularity? And his answer is, well, we'll never know the robots are taking over because we'll already be partly robots. <laughs> so I, I, I don't believe in a singularity other than what historians a millennium from now may say, oh, this happened then, although that period of time was a generation or two. From the perspective of geological time, it looks like a singularity. From inside, it's not exactly that much of a singularity. We evolved. When, when did an ape say, I am now human? <laughs> when did a politician say, I am now fair and just? <laughs> you have politicians like ours, I think. Yes. All our politicians are economists. All of your politicians are economists? I would say that all of our politicians are, well, it would be libelous, so I won't say <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you uh, as well for an interesting talk. My name is Kay Dudman. I'm a lecturer in computing. And uh, I'd like you to comment, please, if you would, on some concepts I see as being related in the context of models, learning, and rules. Um, for example, we can have an orrery which will model the way the planets move. Yes. And it enables us to predict. Yes. So it's useful, but nobody's suggesting that's how it actually works. And thinking about learning, the idea of catastrophe theory, that you can know a series of facts, 
you can know various rules, and then suddenly you flip from one place on the curve to another, and you go from a state of knowing unrelated or unconnected facts to a state of knowing. You're just further up in the same space that you've, you've become knowing, perhaps sentient. And also the idea that rules are interpretation that enable us to predict. We create the rules, not in the sense that we decide what gravity will be, but we create the rules in that we have an interpretation that allows us to predict tra trajectory. I also like the idea of puns, so thinking back to the Odyssey where there is the story of the Cyclops and uh, the pun between Odysseus, his name, and Udais, yes. meaning no one. You translate that into Latin, and Ulick says, uh, does the same dirty deed to the Cyclops, and the Cyclops says, Nemo, no one is hurting me. And it's suddenly not funny anymore. There's, yeah. there's a cultural context, yes. not just language, but a cultural understanding, which helps us to decide whether something is funny or not. And as one of the earlier questioners was saying, if you ask two different uh, Watsons, if you ask the same person, you're going to get a different response. Yes. Even if it's to a small child when it ends up, because I say so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank so, you. So, fascinating issues. Let me tease apart the things I heard there. Uh, first bit, do you own a car? No. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you like to own a car? <laughs> Does anybody here own a car? <laughs> Yay, good. <laughs> well, you just blew apart my first analogy. So in your car, uh, probably it says somewhere it is X horsepower. Reasonably, that's how we do it. I assume that's what you do here as well, too. Although if I were to open the hood, and let's say my engine works at 400 horsepower, if I were to open the hood, I would be eminently surprised if there were 400 horses inside the hood. So the point is that we can achieve certain behavior through mechanisms that happen different than the way the world works. And so it is in our software intensive systems. If I were to take this device and you know, throw it up in the air, it's not calculating along the way. The, uh, it's not integrating along the way, but it's just doing it, although I can model it in that way. I think the same thing is true with our software intensive systems. We can have them behave and act in the world in ways that don't necessarily work in the way the world works, and that's okay, uh, because we're building different kinds of things. The second part of your question deals with what in chaos theory people speak of uh, these attractors. The notion that on the edge of chaos, where I have systems that are so incredibly complex you reach a tipping point. And honestly, I can't tell you when or where that tipping point will happen, but there is this knife edge of complexity that something pushes it over to one side or another. And that's where we're headed with our very complex systems. We see with Osmo, Asmo, the, the device we saw earlier, they're not that complex. There are you know, a few tens of processors going on. But now as I move in the direction, as I told you I'm beginning to deal with, of non-von Neumann processors, of which there are 10 to the 15th of them. I can't model how they're going to behave, but I can take each one of them asynchronously, put them together in the best way I can, and they're going to behave like flocking birds. Can't tell you exactly, but they're going to have this kind of behavior. And I think that's the nature of these massively parallel systems that we see that are very delicate in their behavior. The third thing you talked about touches upon the notion of humor. And there have been a lot of folks, comedians, who have tried to understand the nature of humor, uh, try explaining British humor to you know, somebody in the United States, and they just don't get it, and try explaining Abbott and Costello to somebody here, and you may not get it. So the notion of, of those kinds of things are very, very cultural in their nature. But again, it leads us back to the question, I don't know how I program it, but at the very least, let me turn it back to you and say, what is funny for you, and why is it funny? It causes us to consider what it means for us. And that's the delicious piece of this, this co-evolution of computing and humanity, that as we build these devices that are more and more powerful, it forces us to consider, well, wait a minute, what does it really mean to be human? And really get into the nugget of, of what it distinguishes us from these kinds of devices, as we cling on to what our humanity is. 
So I urge you to ask the question, you know, what does it mean? What's funny for you? Now, afterwards, tell me a joke, and we'll discuss whether or not it's funny. But great question. Let me see. Oh, thank you. <laughs> great, thank you. Fascinating lecture. Uh, my name is Amit. I'm a chief architect with Fujitsu. And a question which I have a slightly different question to the themes of question coming. Uh, with reference to the societies of mind concept, and with reference to your good friend John, John Zachman, how, how would you predict what you just described would imply in future for our business enterprises? How, how would that affect the enterprise architecture for the future enterprise? Great question. <clears throat> Let me start a background process in some of my neurons. <laughs> One of the largest, most difficult problems enterprises are facing these days is the advent of a tsunami of data. Um, there's uh, a phrase, uh, it's an American kind of phrase, which says 80% of everything is crap, including this statement, of course. <laughs> and in the presence of big data, what we're seeing is the potential to collect information more rapidly and in greater volumes than we ever could have imagined. And so the problem is, as Nate Silver speaks of, we have tremendous noise and so what is the challenge for us in the presence of all that information to find the real signal? That, I believe, is the challenge for the enterprise because it's possible for us to fill ourselves, ingest all this information, and get totally lost in it. So I believe enterprises have the challenge to absorb this information and deal with it in ways that are actionable as opposed to just fully reactionable. That's an interesting problem. So architectures like Watson uh, and, and other big data kind of analytics, I view cognitive computing is actually on part of the path of where we're headed with deep analytics, applying human kind of reasoning to the problem of data. Because think about it, as a human, the amount of information I'm getting at any moment in time, it's absolutely overwhelming. And even more so these days, I think somebody said that the human living today, let me go back, person in time in say the 1800s, um, the amount of information they absorb within a lifetime is equivalent to the amount of information at my disposal within a day in my sense. So we are overwhelmed with this information. So both individually as well as enterprises, we have the need to deal with it. I know as a human I have to deal with it, and I filter it in some ways. And what we learn about cognitive computing, I think, therefore, can apply to that tsunami of enterprise systems as well, too. Great question. Great. If we assume that uh, the mind is computable, what would you say were the biggest classes of problems that need to be solved in order to make that happen? There are three that come to mind. Uh, two are technical, one is non-technical. The first technical one is we don't yet know how to really program massively parallel things. We don't have the languages, we don't have the tools, we don't have the methodologies to do so. We know how to build systems like the supercomputers that we see for weather prediction and the like that deal with lots of natural decomposition of concurrency. But here we're talking about concurrency that is much more random in its nature, and we just don't know how to do that. That's one of the projects I'm, I'm trying to put my mind to. The other technical problem is we don't know how to do so in a way that is power efficient. Um, there's interesting discussions in the whole exabyte scale computing, which says that somebody predicted in, in, in a presentation this last week that if you look at where we are in terms of power consumption for current levels of computational power and project it out to exascale computing, which is probably where the mind is, we probably need the output of the Hoover Dam. And so we're not going to get there. But we know within the human brain, this is about 20 watts. So how do we get there? That's a problem to be dealt with. The third one is, is honestly an ethical one, which is we are going to build these things that to one degree or another are replacing us. We are going to build things that have to one degree or enough embody some degree of our ethics. What ethics shall we give them? What shall we teach about right and wrong to these devices? Is it your right or is it my right? And so I think we have to have a discussion in that regard in a right forum to, to build systems like that responsibly. So, thanks. I don't know how we do it, but that dialogue needs to happen. And as a computer scientist, I, I take a kind of curious place in the world because 
I love what I do. Uh, I, I am absolutely in love with this technology. And yet, it's a privilege to do what I do, but it's also a responsibility. And it, that's part of the responsibility. And that's why we're trying to do this, uh, this documentary, because we want to get that dialogue going on. Great question. Fascinating lecture. Um, I was struck by your comments about us co-evolving co yes. with um, sentient type computers. Um, and I wonder if you've got any thoughts on where we are and where we're going in a slightly different aspect, which is computing devices as, if you like, prosthetic add-ons to the human brain. The yes. ability to have new types of sensors or massive memories <laughs> that are somehow directly attached. I already carry my brain in my pocket. Don't we all? It is known as an iPhone. And I love it and I hate it. My wife and I have the delicious honor of living in Maui. Please understand that I dressed up for you because normally this time of day I would be in a swimsuit and I'm not sure that would be appropriate here, but. We'll do our best to adapt. Man, I'm, I'm wearing too many clothes. Let me just be sure of this. We are astonished constantly. Oh, there is a beautiful sunset. It's magnificent. The whales are leaping and the purposes are purposing and the waves are waving. And you see this family here that are all getting their eye tans, looking at their devices because they see nothing else beyond it. And the most important thing are not the whales leaping and the purpose is purposing, but they must tweet that the whales are leaping and the purpose is <laughs> purposing. Sherry Turkle uh, has written, of course, some delightful works in that space. Her, her book, Alone Together, I think captures it very, very well, that already we know these devices are changing us in ways that are subtle and profound, and they will continue to do so. Um, now, you're alluding to the notion of what happens if I build a device that connects with me a little bit more so. We have them already to a degree. Look at the Nike device that you can put a sensor in your shoe and it can track where you are. There are bands you can wear that keep track of your physical activity. Just be careful, as some say, to turn it off when you are having intimate moments, shall we say, because they too can be recorded, which leads us to issues of interesting issues of security and privacy. But of course, we know the NSA already knew I was going to say that. <laughs> But look at the possibilities as well. Um, IBM is developing a thing called the DNA transistor. The ability to take within silicon, take a single drop of blood, drop it through a hole, and sequence the DNA in real time, which is going to reduce the cost of DNA sequencing down from, it used to be several hundred thousand, several million, to a hundred thousand, now it's down to about a thousand dollars. We see it declining to the level of maybe hundreds if not tens of dollars. Now take this device and move it to Africa or some third world country and now all of a sudden I have moved a mobile doctor to that place. In fact, don't even have the doctor there, have an avatar of the doctor. So what's wonderful is we are on the path to create those kinds of things like that to extend ourselves. Google Glass, anybody have a Google Glass by any chance? You do, you've tried one. What do you think about it, Sue? It's cool and it's going to get cooler, okay. I still can't unsee that picture of Robert Scoble in the shower. I don't know if you go check the Twitterverse, but one of the early pictures was, was Robert wearing Google Glass. He was trying to see if it's waterproof, so he stepped in the shower butt naked and there's, we, it was from the waist up, so happily I can't unsee that. Uh, I think the form factor of Google Glass is interesting. I think they're their system engineering is wrong because I think what I would have done is a separation of concerns of this device, which I already carry around, and the glass as a peripheral to it. I think that's the evolution we're headed to right now. Um, so yeah, we're on that path. And I think we see more and more devices that begin to interact with us. The last thing I'll mention in this path is we, we've also seen devices that can interact down at the neural level. So this creates tremendous opportunity for people who are disabled to be able to then you know, fly and walk virtually, if you will, by connections through directly in their brains. That's really cool. Back to the ethical issues, though, it also means that I can sit somewhere comfortably in a suburbia and kill somebody half a world away. What are the ethics associated with that? We have the capacity to do so. What should we as computer scientists, how should we respond to that?
we should be a part of that dialogue. You show that we are approaching uh, probably a kind of AI that can pass the Turing test if we haven't done so already. And we're also giving these AIs a way to interact with the world, even in a, an indirect way, like uh, computer software controlling the electric grid, or the Amazon robots, or drones, or even humanoid robots. And personally, I've always been fascinated by Asimov's three laws. And my question is, are they, do you, do you think they, there is a way to implement them, and are they the right way to go, or is that a limitation on the, uh, on the AI that will cripple it? Well, lots of interesting issues there. Uh, I don't know if his laws can necessarily be translated into a sense of programming, but I think what Asimov has done has given us a goal to seek, a, a goal to follow, and a notion that it is important that we build devices that have some sense of right and wrong whatever that might be. Uh, we have to build such things uh, because we are building things that interact with us and we expect them to behave in ways that are you know, reasonably predictable in terms of right and wrong. Are they the right rules? I don't know. I think they're a good first start to think about. Uh, but it leads to the question of how do you codify, if you were to write the rules for humanity, what would those three rules be? I don't know what they'd be. They're probably not the Ten Commandments. There may be some variation of the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. That's the wrong one. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the politician's golden rule. Sorry. You know what I mean. There's probably some variation. Again, let me turn it back and say, I don't know what the right ones are. But it causes us, as humans, living in a world that is increasingly surrounded by these devices, to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be right and just and fair? And what can we do, therefore, to embody those same kinds of values into the devices we create? There's a very pragmatic reason for it, because we are going to coexist with them. And therefore, we must find a path in which we can do so in a meaningful fashion. Uh, can I just mention one last thing? Of course. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I, I love this profession, I truly do. It is something I have given uh, my life's effort to and it has rewarded me greatly. You reward me by allowing me to be here. So thank you, it's a real privilege. Thank you very much. Okay, well, sadly, time has defeated us. I'm sure the conversation could go on all evening, but I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sue Black, Senior Research Associate at UCL, to give the vote of thanks. Wasn't that wonderful? I mean, what an absolutely enjoyable, fabulous lecture. I could, um, I could stand here all night and say how wonderful it was. Um, I'm absolutely honoured to have been invited to give the vote of thanks tonight to uh, Grady Booch, one of my heroes from when I was an undergraduate, so it's uh, a great honour for me. Um, I thought that was a really wonderful lecture, and uh, Grady talked about opening the curtains um, on the, the world of software engineering at the beginning. Um, but I think, Grady, you really opened the curtains for us onto a whole kind of intellectual journey through intelligence, sentience, um, what is consciousness, and we had Daleks and Star Trek as well, so <laughs> woo for the, geek, for the geeks. <laughs> Um, I really love the sentence that um, the story of computing is the story of humanity. And that's going to kind of stay with me. And I'm sure that's one of those kind of sentences that's going to um, reverberate around my head as, as I uh, go on with my life. Because I think there's a lot in that. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting concept to kind of think about and carry around. <coughs> one thing I really didn't like that I have to point out uh, is the fact that you don't allow Watson to swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn it, we'll fix it next time. <laughs> just think of the comedy value. Just think of the comedy value in that. And uh, I want to see a swearing Watson. I just don't really need to see that. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you were on the board of the Computer History Museum Correct. in Mountain View, which I've visited and is yes. wonderful. And uh, as I'm one of the trustees of Bletchley Park here in the UK, 
Um, I'm hoping that you will uh, go and visit Bletchley Park and the National Museum in, in the UK uh, if you have time. My wife um, and I have been there several times. Excellent, actually. excellent, a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank you very much for a very thought-provoking lecture. I think we all had a really wonderful evening. I think this is one of the best uh, BCS lectures I've ever been to, if not the best. Um, and uh, because it's not just about computing now, it's about the whole of humanity, and I absolutely love that. So I would like to propose a vote of thanks to the wonderful Grady Booch. Thank you very much. For being here. Thank, thank you very much, Sue, and I'm sure everyone in this room echoes uh, your comments. Um, before we conclude, as is tradition, I'd just like to give you information about the winner for uh, next year. The 2013 Lovelace Medal winner is Dr. Samson Abramsky from the University of Oxford, so I hope you will come back next year to listen to him. Uh, finally, all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for taking time to come and join us this evening. Uh, for those who've actually uh, booked for the reception, I hope you will come and, and uh, uh, participate in the buffet and continue the conversation with Brady Boots. Thank you very much. <laughs>